Our second scripture reading is Colossians 2, 6 through 19. As therefore you received Christ Jesus the Lord, so live in him, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. See to it that no one makes a prey of you by philosophy and empty deceit according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the universe and not according to Christ. For in him, whole fullness of deity dwells bodily, and you have come to fullness of life in him, who is the head of all rule and authority. In him also you were circumcised, and with a circumcision made without hands, by putting off the body of flesh in the circumcision of Christ. And you were buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him throughout faith, through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. And you who were dead in trespasses and uncircumcised of your flesh, God made alive altogether with him. Having forgiven us all of our trespasses, having canceled the bond which stood against us with its legal demands, this he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the principalities and powers and made a public example of them, triumphing over them in him. Therefore, let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food and drink or with regard to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath. These are only a shadow of what is to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. Let no one disqualify you, insisting on self-abasement and worship of angels, taking this stand on visions, puffed puffed up without reason by his sensuous mind, but, and not holding fast to the head, from whom the whole body, nourished and knit together through its joints and ligaments, grow with the growth that is from God. Amen. One of my colleagues in the conference this week posted on our um, Facebook group what they didn't teach us in seminary. <laughs> Um, was how to get up Sunday after Sunday, week after week, and continue preaching when there are such tremendous crises of violence that happen and keep happening. And how do we do that faithfully? Um, And as I was reflecting on that, I thought of a conversation with another colleague of mine. Um, It was appointment season, and I will just confess that's as nerve-wracking for us pastors as it is for the churches. It's a very anxious time. And, And I was talking with him as a clergy couple that amps it up even more of how they'll both do it um, together. But then him responding in this very rooted faith that said, it has always worked out in the past. I have no reason to doubt that God won't work it out again. And I love that rootedness. If I'm completely honest, I envy that rootedness because it's not something that I always have. But it's so real and so powerful, and so needed. Life is messy. Things get so tangled, and we have a global view of that right now, in addition to personal views that some have shared here today in joys and concerns, and some that remain silent in our hearts. If there's anything that we can count on, It's that life will give us wounds and that there will be a tangle of pain that happens not only on the personal level, but the systemic level as well. And we have talked about doing this first month journey of appointment together by looking to the epistles, the letters to the early church and how they formed themselves, and looking to the Psalms, the prayers of our mothers and fathers of faith, and how they built their faith and rooted themselves. Last week, we talked about what it means to have a Savior who is Christ, what it means to believe in a Savior who can take a symbol of death and of torture meant to instill fear and hold a power over another 
and flip that around to now be a symbol all around the world for thousands of years of hope and of life. That is the power we have in Jesus Christ. And this week, that is Paul's call to us to root ourselves in that power and to build ourselves up in it because there will be plenty of other powers that we face. The psalm today comes from the Hebrews returning from exile. So there had been all of those years of pain, right? Of being deported, of their temple being destroyed, of not knowing who they were or where they were. Talk about life turned completely upside down. Think of all the refugees that there are and that are going through this exact experience right now. But this psalm comes to us not in the beginning of that exile, of the raw grief of being sent out. It comes to us in the grief of returning. The Hebrews have made it home. Cyrus, you know, that king of Persia has made the decree. They've gone back. They've started rebuilding. And what was supposed to be the most amazing, wonder-filled experience of their life has just turned into more tangle and more pain and more hard times. Because we have this law of science called entropy, right? That all things tend toward disorder. And unfortunately, that holds true for us and all of our relationships and all of the systems that we have built, as well as the physical universe. And so the Hebrews come back, and there's still those same roots that, and stones that have to be dug up and broken because that exile happened in a time period. Do you remember the prophet Jeremiah standing on the temple steps, you know, saying that you have got to take care of the widow and the orphan and the stranger in your midst, that you're taking care more of yourselves than others and the system is falling apart. The one place that is supposed to be for the well-being of all people is now only for the well-being of some but yet you stand here in this temple and say that the Lord will protect you and so you can do anything because this is the house of the Lord, it doesn't work that way. And there was an entire exile of confession and of repentance and of turning around and coming home. But you see, it was the elite who were deported and the poor who were left behind because the Babylonians didn't see them as a threat and so now the elite were returning, and those who had been left behind had rebuilt their lives and had formed new structures and new systems and new ways of living. And now they had to figure all of that out all over again, with PTSD all over again of what had happened before. And what I love about this psalm is how honest it is. This first part is an exhortation to God to not remember the anger and, I'm sorry, to not, let me just read it, to withdraw God's anger and to turn from God's rage, to revoke God's displeasure. It takes real. It takes, in all honesty, the reality of God's wrath and anger that is directed towards them for the system that they were a part of creating and not a part of dismantling completely. But it also doesn't end there, for as real as the psalmist treats God's wrath, it also equally treats God's faithfulness and steadfast love. And as much as this first paragraph is an exhortation to God to be present, this next is an exhortation to self, let me hear what God the Lord will speak. And so the psalmist starts. The psalmist starts with all the mess that is grating at his or her people's souls. And he acknowledges the part that they have played in that mess. But he also remembers, like my friend did, how God had been present and how things had worked out before. That's the song that we just sang. 
of Noah who built the ark before the floods came, of Abraham who left without knowing the land that God would show to him, of the Hebrews finding a path to freedom through an undivided sea. We remember in these messes how impossible life has felt as we encounter other messes in our life. And we teach ourselves the body, soul, memory of knowing that as much as what once felt impossible, God did make possible. And so God can do that again now. Let me hear what God the Lord will speak. This is the Tanakh version from the Jewish Publication Society. God will promise well-being to his people, to his faithful ones. May they not turn to folly. His help is very near for those who fear him to make his glory dwell in our land. Faithfulness and truth meet. Justice and well-being kiss. Truth springs up from the ground. Justice looks down from heaven. The Lord also bestows his bounty on our land, yields its produce. Justice goes before him as he sets out on his way. Justice and truth, righteousness and faithfulness will surround us. They will spring up from the ground and they will come overhead and they will envelop us and encircle us in their care. For the people who were facing the rebuilding of the city, for us who are refacing the rebuilding of trust in a time that is dominated by fear, if we talk to anybody who did a little bit work at our sites this week, we know how hard it is to dig. We know how tenacious those root systems can be, and we know that pickaxes break, and we have to get new ones, because I'm that good. Yeah, no, not really. <laughs> There are stones that get in our way of all kinds of sizes. Sometimes a dig bar can crush them, no problem. Sometimes it takes all kinds of equipment and all kinds of people working together to get them out of the way. It's hard work. But as anyone who worked this week knows how much it's worth it knows how much it's worth to see in the face of a resident the impossible made possible. Anyone who's been there knows how much it is worth it to feel the relationships that were built within our team and with our residents. To know that there is a way to come together as strangers. It's a way for need to meet resource and that fear and violence don't have to be the only stories that are told in our world this week. And one more story from one more colleague because it takes a village <laughs> to do this journey. I have a friend um, who is out in Colorado and making a visit and a hike and found a grove of quaking aspen, our, vision, our uh, visual this morning. Um, and with the ranger, um, found something that I never knew to be the case. You see all of these individual trees, and we had to crop it, so you only have two of the aspen right here. But it's a grove through here. Um, they're not individual trees. Quaking aspens clone, and they're in part of one organism, that one root system that can span 1 to 20 acres. One organism, one root system. And did you know that because of that, when forest fires or other messes and entanglements come, these are the first to come back to life and to re-sprout? And that they can do that even after having been dormant for a hundred years? Because of their root system. Our ancestors, our mothers and fathers of faith, face the impossible too. Just as we today face the impossible in our personal lives and our collective life. But if we can follow Paul's words to us, to root ourselves in Jesus Christ, and to build ourselves up in him, 
in a different power, in a different story, one that is life in death and wholeness and brokenness, then yes, we will be wounded, we will be burned, and life will be incredibly painful. But that will not be the last word of our story. Because if we are connected in a root system that has at its core the life of the Trinity, then we will come back. We will grow again, and we will be a sign and a witness to all of those who feel the heat and the pain of fire and who want desperately to find life again. This is what it means to be faithful. This is what it means to be rooted and to be built up in Christ. It means that we can claim the impossible as possible. It means that we can live as those who are prepared to die and we can die as those who go forth to live because we know that our living and our dying are rooted in a love a love of our God and Jesus Christ, which nothing, nothing in all this world, no height nor power, no thing past or present, no angel nor demon, nothing, no power or principality can separate us from. So may we root ourselves and build ourselves up in this love. Amen.